Everybody, how y'all doing today? This is your boy Pastor Steve Caldwell coming to you today. Just walking into the sanctuary, getting set for tonight's Bible study. Where's the black presence in the Bible? Is Christianity a white man's religion? Does God condone slavery in the Bible? Listen, get everybody together. We're going to have a candid conversation today talking about these subject matters. Now, I want to tell you offhand, it won't be an exhaustive study tonight. We may have to visit this more than once, but we want you to have some foundational understanding about these particular subject matters. So, go tell you everybody, we're getting ready to have Bible study here at the New Providence Missionary Baptist Church. I'm walking in the sanctuary, getting ready to have a good time for you today. The Bible says in all your getting, get understanding. We're going to take a look at that today. So let's get ready to have Bible study. Let's go deeper so we can go higher. See you soon. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's put our hands together. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Amen, amen. I want to thank the Lord for our candidates who have just been baptized. Amen. Amen. We had Evangelist Knight. Amen. Sister Love and Sister Cigar. Amen. God bless them. Come on, let's thank the Lord again uh, for them. Now, normally... Uh, we would have a right hand of fellowship and all that good stuff, amen. But they, they are, they've been members for quite a while, and so uh, oftentimes we need a refreshing. And, uh, and so that's what uh, their uh, symbolism today was, a fresh new start in their walk with God and uh, to go higher, amen. Uh, so let's thank the Lord again one more time for, for these tonight. Um, I do want to say uh, who we have, Facebook, we have YouTube, we have Roku, praise the Lord, uh, are all watching us tonight. And so we want to say welcome to each of you, that camera right there, welcome to each of you tonight for being with us. Uh, we know that you could have been with any other church tonight, and we thank you for joining us tonight as we are starting a different format, something new for our ministry, uh, candid conversation about Christianity and, uh, and the church. And uh, tonight we are endeavoring to tackle uh, another, uh, I would say, a popular subject, uh, not as controversial as the subject we had last week. If you didn't get an opportunity to uh, view or, or be here for our subject matter on last Tuesday, you missed a great uh, teaching, and uh, it is uh, entitled, Is God Pro-Life or Pro-Choice? And uh, we had a great learning experience. Uh, it was a wonderful didactic exercise that we employed uh, so that all of those of you who were watching and those of you who are here uh, could have a great time uh, unpacking the Word of God. Um, so just a little recap from last week. Um, was anybody challenging their thinking and their theology uh, on last week? Uh, were you pushed a little bit? Uh, did you have to go back and re relearn some stuff? Uh, or better yet, uh, get back into the Word and learn some more stuff? Uh, it was interesting. I had a conversation with a few pastors concerning this issue, and um, believe it or not, uh, several of the brethren were like, I am not touching that subject, brother. Uh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> uh, they, they just said, well, they'll, we'll leave that to God and the individual, right? Uh, but I believe that as an urban apologist and a Christian apologist, I'm a, uh, I won't say a, a master, but I am um, proficient in Christian apologetics, especially urban apologetics, 
And so this is what we do. We take on difficult passages. We take on difficult uh, subject matters, and we try to educate those who God has given us stewardship over uh, so that uh, you all would be uh, fully equipped for every good work. Uh, it would never be that New Providence members are not biblically uh, literate. If you're a member of New Providence, you're going to know your Bible. And that sets the basic <laughs> bottom line. Amen. So for all of you who are watching, if you want to go deeper so that you can go higher, this is the place, the place to be. Amen. And so we talked about some things last week. We were challenged last week. And so uh, tonight um, we are going to delve into a, uh, a subject matter that is uh, permeating uh, throughout uh, this, this um, modern thought process, if I can characterize it that way. Uh, there are many who believe now, especially millennials and uh, Generation Z, uh, I think I'm in the right place. Uh, if I'm not, Melissa, help me out. I, if, if I am Z Zers, I think that's where we are, um, right? Yes. Amen. So um, they're falling away from the church. Uh, remember back in the day we went to church and we didn't question mom. Y'all remember that time? Yes. Um, Stevie Wonder uh, had a, a stanza in one of his songs. Um, uh, Mama give you candy for, Mama give you money for Sunday school. You trade your for candy after Sunday school. I wish those days could. Okay, y'all act like y'all just all saved and stuff. Y'all y'all know. The <laughs> Amen. Uh, we would go to Sunday school. Uh, I know I would go to Sunday school because I was ready not to hear the word so much. I was wanting that chocolate milk and cookies uh, that we had. Amen. But I thank God Mama took me to the church. And um, it wasn't until 19, I think it was 1964, um, an artist drew a picture of his depiction of what Jesus looked like. Um, and that particular picture made it made it way, made its way into many homes of African descendants. That picture of or the portrait of Jesus not only made its way into uh, the homes of African descendants, but into the churches where black people congregated together. And it was a blonde haired, subtle blonde, blue eyed man who painted his cousin, an actual man, painted his cousin. And, uh, and he was a white Jesus. And Growing up, I did not really pay attention to it. Uh, Mama said that that's what Jesus looked like. Uh, she was told. And so I just went along with it. But it wasn't until I saw an episode of Good Times. <laughs> I must admit that I started questioning what this Jesus looked like. Y'all, you all remember the militant midget? His name was Michael. His name was Michael. And Michael said that Jesus didn't look like that picture. And the very picture that they had on the good times is the picture that most of us had in our black churches. Now, I can hear somebody that may be watching today and may be saying, well, Pastor, what, what difference does it make if Jesus is white, if Jesus is black? Uh, what, what difference does it make? And I would say to them, <coughs> excuse me, I would say to them, what difference did it make to change what he looked like? 
Because certainly the Jesus that was on my mama's, uh, she had a part in the living room. In Chicago, we had, like, you come upstairs, come in the door, you enter right into the dining room. You go to the right, that's the living room. Go to the left, there's a little hallway. There's a bathroom on the left. Go to the hallway, there's a, there's a bedroom on the left. Take four steps, literally four steps. There's a bathroom right there. Take six more steps. There's another bedroom. Go through that bedroom. There's another bedroom in the back of that bedroom. And on the back of all that is the kitchen. <laughs> Brownstone, right? And, and so, so mama had in the living room, grandmama had in the living room, uh, Sis Young, uh, a quilt type of thing. With John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. Martin Luther the King, amen. And then next to that was this blonde head, blue eyed man, she called Jesus. It wasn't until I went to seminary. I went to seminary at Regent University where I did my master's and doctorate studies. And it was the first time in my life that I went to school with white folk. It was the first time being around white people in an educational setting. I had white coaches, I had white teachers, but I never had white classmates. Because you get to spend time with the classmates. And so projects that we had to complete. And in these particular settings, you can sense the air of superiority. They used to call me Miami Steve. My classmates called me that. Because I, I showed up with the national, it was just after we won the national championship at the University of Miami. We was fresh, so we was the hot thing, right? You know, everybody wanted, you know, the you stuff, right? It was 2002, 2003, you know, we were still fresh, you know, still winning all the time. And uh, I was Miami Steve, but we got into some debates about Pentecostalism. Got into some debates about Pentecostalism, and for us Baptists, you know, you we have to, you know, as a professor and everything, you have to know others. But as a Baptist, arguing Pentecostalism felt strange uh, to me. Uh, but I had some understanding of it all. And when you understand. Anybody ever heard of William J. Seymour? Anybody ever heard of that name? William J. Seymour in Los Angeles, California, 1906, uh, founded what was known as one of the most uh, powerful meetings in Christendom in, in the modern era. It was the birth of Pentecostalism, and it was where they had a seven-year revival at Azusa Street. People were being healed. And William J. Seymour was blind in one eye. And we had um, some people try to take the power of Pentecost from William J. Seymour and try to give it over to those who were of the assemblies of God. I'm just talking about my experience. This is candid conversation, right? The assemblies of God came out of Church of God in Christ. Church of God in Christ, <coughs> William J. Seymour founded the Pentecostal movement 19 in the 20th century in the 1900s. C.H. Mason goes to Los Angeles for Azusa Street, comes back to Memphis, Tennessee, founds the Church of God in Christ, and he ordained some white guys. But after the movement started to grow, these white guys 
thought that they could not be under the leadership of a Negro. And they left after being ordained to the faith, claimed the word of God, the truth of God. They went to Cleveland, Tennessee, and they started Assemblies of God. And so why does all of this mean anything? A Mesopotamian proverb says that if horses were the dominant culture, then God would look like a horse. I'll let that set in for a second. If horses were the dominant culture, then God would look like a horse. In essence, those who have the perceived dominance within the culture, the paradigm, this particular area of ethos, if they are the dominant, then they want God to look like them. And it is interesting to know that as we look at Christianity, because you all do know that most African American millennials and Z generation say that we serve the white man's God. Have y'all heard that? And so what's your argument? When someone says you serve the white man God, what, how do you respond? Let me hear you. What, what, how do you respond? Don't be ashamed. Sister McGregor, how, how do you respond when, when they say you serve the white man's God? Right, right. You serve a spiritual God. You serve a spiritual God. That, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Anyone else? Anyone else want to try uh, or give a response to the question, an answer to the question? When you serve, you serve the white man's religion. Evangelist Knight? I serve the true and living God. All right. The true and living God. All right. That's 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 good answer. Good answer. Meaning that God is living. He is alive. God is alive. He's not dead. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Deacon McGregor. I would say to that answer that I serve a sovereign God because the God that I serve belongs to no man. And I don't belong to no man. That's a good answer as well. God is sovereign. Evangelist Wallace, you like to be next. Sovereign God, spirit God, living God. I like this. Well, I think about it as I guess I would give an honest study for for a prayer and it's going back to the Mesopotamia spirit. Mm-hmm. much God, but when I look at Jesus, then I look at him differently. Yes. Because, see, God is a spirit. There you go. Okay, so since God is a spirit, he has no color. But, but when I look at his son, his son um, had melanin mm -hmm. um, in his complexion. So, and especially coming out of the, that far um, part of the east, that he came out of, and which is basically Africa, I think, uh, or in the. It is, it is, because the, the tectonic plate that comes across that is also the same tectonic plate that comes across in Africa. So it is a region of Africa, although we call it the Middle East. It's an African region. 
Yes. So, so what I hear is, we talked about God being spirit, but the great separator is Yeshua. And when I say Yeshua, everybody say Yeshua. Yeshua is the Hebrew word for Jesus, or Yahshua, Joshua, means Savior, or he who saves. And so it's important that we have this particular connection. To me, it's important. I don't know about you, uh, but to me, it's important because it is, it's, it's Dr. Cone talks about this. He talks about, about when you get a chance, study Dr. Cone, Black Liberation Theology. Uh, he talks about Jesus is uh, the, the God, God of the oppressed. And when Jesus has come to, to, to heal the sick, he's, he's come to bring liberty to those who are captives. He come to bring sight to the blind, all right? Uh, and many would say that this is an advocation for social justice. But it's important to me that we understand where we are in this landscape of connection to Yeshua. I, I hear Alan Parr saying that, you get a chance to study Alan Parr, he, he's black, but he doesn't use the term or he doesn't make himself inclusive. When he explains this, I have a problem with a person being of our melanin and our heritage uh, and not associating himself within the context of the teaching. I'm black. Now, I may have some other stuff in me somewhere. Henry Louis Gates can figure that out. Uh, amen. But for the most part, I'm a Negro. I'm an African-American. I'm a descendant of Africans. I'm a descendant of slaves. And so, so we want to talk about this for a second, and I want to get into uh, some conversation with you all um, and, and, and give you some reference that we can look to. Uh, Sean, if you, if you have, I don't know if you have any of those uh, slides up that we can, we can uh, pull them up, but I, I want you all to understand that archaeologists and scientists and uh, social scientists have agreed, uh, you all, that all of creation started in Africa. It is agreed that everything living today came from this area. Everything. And, uh, and, 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 um, I heard one scholar say that for many of us, our history was not written. It was passed down. We had stories. We would spend time with the children, talking about our elders, giving them the stories of our heritage, of our, of our truth and our relationship with God. And so when we come to uh, America, now I may just hit and miss and go, go here and there, but y'all just stay with me. But when it comes to American Christianity, American Christianity is white. It is. It is whitewashed. And, and, and what I mean by that is the, the oppressor, uh, the oppressed became the oppressor. In colonization, they were oppressed by Great Britain, came over here, and through the word of God, they took the Bible. And did you all know there was a certain Bible created just for the slaves? It was, it was, it was, Cheryl, it was scriptures for slaves. And, you know, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Bible says this Judas went out and hung himself and you know you want God to speak to you and you y'all y'all ever, ever had this you know when y'all when y'all really wasn't saved and you wanted to figure out what God wanted to say to you so you open the Bible let it fall down y'all y'all ever had that and you pick something out 
to fall on. And then you say, Lord, talk to me, talk to me. And God says, go to this scripture in your mind. Go to this scripture. And then you went to one scripture that says, and Judas went out and hung himself. They say, oh, no, oh, no. Then you go to another scripture. Then it says, and you go do likewise. Okay, some of y'all missed a joke in that, but. <laughs> In other words, you can make the Bible say what you want to make the Bible say. So let, let's, let's, let's deal with this, that, that, that the black people in the Bible, everyone in the Bible that we know of is of melanin, I, I hate to say melanin descent, but has a, a high level of melanin in their, in their body. Uh, if you really want to try to find white folk, you won't find white people in the Bible too much. You won't find them too much except in Genesis uh, when we get to the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Most of the Europeans descend from Japheth. But Shem is where the Israelites came from. Ham is where the Negroid, the African race of people came from. You all do know that you can be Negroid and not African, right? Okay, let me see. If you go to India, you'll see a, a, an Indian man, not from Africa, but from India, born and raised, but he got skin like you, but a hair like a white man, all right? All right? So when you, when you go to Genesis, you see where Ham had four sons, Hut, Cush, Mizram, and Canaan, all right? All of his sons inhabited the continent of Africa. And so this is where we get the lie, the first lie. The first lie is when they took the Bible and they said that Africans or Negroid people were to be servants of their brothers. And so this is called the Hermetic curse, the curse of Ham. The Bible doesn't say Ham was cursed. The Bible says curse be Canaan. Now why Canaan was cursed, we don't literally no, but he had something to do with his grandfather's nakedness and drunkenness. All right? Um, Ham um, was the one who laughed at his father, and, and we know that he didn't cover his father like his other two sons did. He made a mockery of his dad. And so this is where we get this hermetic curse from. Uh, and then when we get into racism, right, we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the dominant culture saw blackness as something to be of servitude because we don't get into race until later on in the 18th century. Race was even part of the landscape of humanity. It was not an existential anything. It was, it was just where we are come from, nationality. Race was not even a part of anything until the white man made up this thing called race. But when we, when we see Ham uh, uh, sons, Mizram, Put, Cush, and Canaan, transliterated, says young, uh, Mizram is Egypt, Put is Libya, Cush is Ethiopia, and Canaan is Palestine, where Israel is, the land of Canaan. The Philistines come from out of there. I bet y'all didn't know that Goliath was a tall, dark, and handsome brother. And David, who was a Shemite, was olive in complexion and uh, a little darker as well. And then you got some who are uh, perpetuating the fact that the original Jews were all black. But they had black, they had African blood. How do we know that? Okay. In Genesis, you all remember Joseph. 
Remember, Joseph was sold into slavery. Where did Joseph go when he was sold into slavery? To Egypt. Where is Egypt? In Africa. What color are Africans? Black. And when his brothers came to Egypt, him being a Shemite, he came to Egypt being Hamites. They couldn't tell the difference. Because his brothers thought that he was an Egyptian. Remember? When they came before him twice. They couldn't tell. They said, bring, he said, bring Benjamin to me. And they would say, no, we can't bring the baby boy because he may not come back and our father will die if he doesn't come back. So they bring him back. But remember, Joseph was reared, not reared so much, but his formative years were in Egypt. While in Egypt, he married an Egyptian. Had two sons by this black queen. And I heard somewhere that any ounce of Negro make you all. <laughs> Hello. So, so, so Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Their mother was an Egyptian woman. In Chronicles, you will see the tribes of Judah. Jesus descends from the line of Judah. Well, Judah slept with Canaanite women. Dan as well. So did Asher and Naphtali. And so you have at least six of the 12 tribes of Israel with African blood. Hello, somebody. And so, so when, we, when, we, when we look at this, we see this from a foundational principle, right? So, this begs the question then, was Jesus white? I think y'all know the answer by now. <laughs> he was not white. He was not a white man. So, if he wasn't white, and, his, and it's pure Christianity, right? Because Christianity is pure, right? Yes. Christianity is pure. It's undefined, right? But anytime man gets involved, you muddy the water. So for all of y'all who, who are looking for the perfect church, and the perfect pastor, God bless your heart. Because the day you show up, it just became messed up. It's a little hyperbole expression, nonetheless. Because we are a group of imperfect people who yielded our lives to a perfect intermediator called Jesus who submitted ourselves as he did to a perfect God. And he gave us imputed righteousness, which makes us right with him without being right with him. Some of y'all catch that later. Y'all, y'all done heard y'all say, you better get right with God. I'm already right with him. Hello, somebody. I've accepted Jesus Christ. His son, Amen. All right, so 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 where where so if if there's a black presence in the Bible, how did the Bible get so white? Well, Cheryl, you have Western Christianity, and you have Eastern Christianity, and so when we get over here to the West, all right. Africa is east, the United States is west, and so Western Christianity. So when, when, when we 
when we get Western Christianity, it's whitewashed. It's whitewashed to the point where it is seen that God is white. Everybody in the Bible is white. When you look at pictures, if you Google right now, I guarantee you, if you Google right now the Apostle Paul and go to images, you will see white men pop up instantaneously. You, 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 you'll, see, you'll see white folk pop up instantaneously because the dominant coach, right? So if we want this to be true, we want it to be connected directly to us. But it's important that we know the truth. And see, the reason why I'm teaching this in such a way is because we have men and women who have gone into occultic practices because they're giving them a cultural identity that connects them to God. While us Christians sit by idly and watch, thank you, Sean, and watch, watch our young black men and young black girls go off to other religions. It's important, saints, to culturally identify with God in your ethnicity. If it, if, it, if, it, if it doesn't mean that much to you, and I think it should, and here's why I think it should. It's the opposite end of the continuum, Sister McGregor, because if it meant so much to them to change the truth, it's got to mean something to you and I to correct what has been changed. So is Christianity the white man's religion? Did that this particular, this particular notion of Christianity being the white man's religion came around the 16th century. Prior to that, it was not even considered a thought. Then it permeated after slavery, and it took root during the 60s, it took really strong roots during the 60s. Islam came to the forefront. Hebrew Israelism came to the forefront. Moors, if y'all, we'll get into Moors, we'll study about them as well. Um, um, indigenous black folk in the United States of America, along with the Indians. The Indians weren't the only ones here. And so when we, when, we, when we get to that, it means something to them, so it has to mean something to us. So did God promote slavery the way slavery was done? What do you all think? The kind of slavery that our ancestors endured, was that sanctioned by God? Shall I get that video ready? So let's, let's prepare to see this a little bit. Because some of us are visual learners. And some of us can look, amen. Because some of y'all are fall asleep listening to me lecture. And so, so I want us to have a visual presentation. While Shauna's getting that together, Melissa, any questions? Um, right now, no. We, um, I think they're really stunned by what you're saying. So I'm on Zoom and I'm on uh, Facebook, and so far, I think they're kind of scared to ask a question. No, don't be scared to ask. Sister McGregor. Let me read something to you. I'm glad you, I, I, I put something up concerning that, Sister McGregor, um, on, on our, on our uh, Facebook page. And um, we might as well just go with the whole Holy Ghost. The flow of this, listen to what Frederick Douglass said. Now, today is July the 5th, right? Frederick Douglass 
I was invited to speak to the group of abolitionists in about July 4th. And he refused to come on July 4th to speak. Instead, he chose, uh, told them he would speak on July the 5th. And on July 5th, this is what he said. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice at this time, but I must mourn. Frederick Douglass spoke that on July 5th. And he also, and he also wanted to talk about, uh, if you all get a chance, go back and read this, this poem by Frederick Douglass um, uh, about the 4th of July. Uh, he, he talks about the Christianity that is espoused. Uh, he, he begged to differ that this was the type of Christianity that God intended. Anyone else? Continue. Go ahead. There's not too many. There's not too many questions you can ask. No, because I feel like you know we were brainwashed because that's all we know. You know, just like how we celebrate Easter and Christmas. We're gonna get into those later. You know, yeah, we're. And And you and and you should, and I I believe you should, um, uh, you know. But but here's what we're gonna do: if they're going to give us the day off and pay us for it, they might as well pay us something. That's some kind of reparations right there. Praise the Lord, Amen, <laughs> Amen. Um, but but we we celebrate it, and that's what I articulated, Amen, to my family yesterday. Um, this understanding of Frederick Douglass. Um, when, when, we, when we understand this, now remember, the genesis of all of this, Christianity being the white man's God, it stems from the enslavement of our people. It stems from us having to go through um, this horrific time in American history. Do you all know that we were in slavery 246 years and America turned 246 yesterday? Amen. And so, so uh, we've been in slavery longer than they, it's been a nation. While we was yet colony, a colony, uh, we had been enslaved. Um, God speaks directly to this type of slavery. And I want us to understand that the type of slavery that is found in the Bible, it is not the type of slavery that God intended for us to do or to, for us to go through. These particular Christians took the word of God and twisted it. And the reason why black folk, our great-great-grandmamas and granddaddies could, could not read was because not because they didn't want to read, but it was against the law for them to read. Why would you stop me from reading? Because I might grab that Bible and find out through the Holy Ghost, get the interpretive process going on, and rightly divide the word of truth and say, I'm not supposed to be in this situation. Because my God is a God of liberation. Every 50 years is a year of jubilee, and every debt, debt should be canceled. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 20, God says that every seventh year, Slavery ended. And when you really look at slavery from the Hebraic sense, it was really talking about another Hebrew enslaving another Hebrew. Not another race. And the Bible deals with race as foreigners or sojourners or alien. You will see those particular tags about uh, others. But when we understand how they took the word of God and twisted it and used it as an economic engine. When we, <clears throat> when we look at slavery in the biblical sense, it was endangered servitude. And the Bible forbade kidnapping another person. 
and selling them into slavery. Exodus chapter 20 through 25 deals with this. John, let's, let's take a look at this, and then we'll come back and we'll dissect it. It's a great question, um, and it's a simple question, but if you actually stop and reflect on it, there is so much historical uh, complication and nuance to it. And the, the most critical thing I think to point out is when we use the word slavery uh, in, mo in the modern world, we're approaching that idea and the word itself of slavery in a fundamentally different way than the ancient world did, particularly the context in which the scriptures were inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by, by human authors. Um, so when we approach slavery, for example, in Philemon, we're talking about slavery in the Greco-Roman world, and in particular in the Roman Empire. And it was a very different institution than it was in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries in the transatlantic world and the West African uh, chattel slave trade. It's also worth pointing out that slavery in the Old Testament, um, you, you find, for example, uh, Israel is in bondage. I mean, the Old Testament talks a lot about slavery, and it's very clear that Israel is suffering uh, in bondage in Egypt, in enslavement, and that it is a wicked and abusive system. One of the things that's most critical to point out is that the scriptures, for example, in Exodus 21, uh, condemns uh, the kidnapping and sale of people. Just flat out. And the modern slave trade, the slave trade that, that took men and women from West Africa, kidnapped them, sold them, put them on ships and brought them on the Middle Passage to the British colonies and then to the United States and sold them like cattle, uh, that, is, that is expressly forbidden by the Bible, which forbids, prohibits kidnapping and selling people. Uh, so we can, we can have clear moral authority from the scriptures, not just the New Testament, but from the Old Testament, that makes it very clear that slavery is practiced in the modern world, the modern slave trade, was antithetical to biblical justice and righteousness. And so when we talk about slavery in the ancient world, there are a couple differences worth pointing out. One, slavery in the Roman Empire, for example, uh, was often an economic uh, agreement, an arrangement, uh, that sometimes these were conquered peoples that were subordinated to the conquering people. It was not perpetual, is the other thing worth pointing out. Uh, so it didn't transcend generations. The, the children of slaves were not, by nature of their of who they, what family they were born into, they were not predestined, so to speak, or doomed to themselves to be enslaved. There were opportunities uh, for exiting uh, enslaved status. It was an economic arrangement. Uh, secondly, uh, slaves in the Roman Empire were often incredibly well educated. Uh, so you find, for example, members of the upper class who were taught by uh, slaves. Uh, they were their teachers. And that's in, in stark contrast with what we find in the modern slave trade, where slaves, for example, in, in the American South, uh, were forbidden from learning to read because slave masters in the South understood that if you let slaves learn how to read, they might read their Bibles and they might actually start to raise questions about liberty. And so there was a profound difference in that category too, in that respect about uh, slavery in the, in the ancient world and in the modern world. And then third and maybe most significantly, uh, slavery in the ancient world, in the biblical world, was never racialized. When we talk about slavery in the modern world, this transatlantic kidnapping of men and women, from, particularly from West Africa and their, and their, uh, their transport uh, to, the, to North America, we're talking about a whole system that was predicated upon the idea that one group of people, based on perceived physical appearances and differences, that they are somehow um, suited for enslavement in ways that others are not. And the whole idea of race gets constructed and developed in that context in the 18th and 19th centuries, the idea of blackness and whiteness, that blackness is what qualifies someone for subordination to enslavement, and whiteness is what keeps one exempt from that subordination. That is a very modern idea. And uh, so when we come to the, again, to the conversation about slavery in the Bible, when we read Paul uh, appealing uh, in Philemon about uh, Onesimus, uh, we're not talking about slavery as it existed in, say, Kentucky or Mississippi or Alabama in the 19th century. We're talking about something that was an economic arrangement in the Roman Empire. And nonetheless, even for all those differences, when Paul writes 
to Philemon. He calls on Philemon to receive Onesimus back, not as his slave, not as his uh, servant, but as his brother in, Ch- in Philemon. And so there's, Paul understands that when two men who previously had an economic arrangement, there was a, an employer and employee relationship, as soon as this one man now, uh, Onesimus, has been converted, he's been brought into the family, into the household of God, his fundamental identity and relationship now with Philemon is going to be one of a brother. Uh, not an employee, not even a slave, but as a member of the household of God. Amen. I want to thank Dr. Hall for, for that video and being forthright and giving the true exegesis of the word of God and the intention of God as it relates to uh, this particular aspect of slavery. Uh, we, we, we have learned uh, to look in Exodus, look at Exodus from chapter 20 to all the way to 25, and seeing some fundamental elements of uh, what God says about this. It is clear beyond any argument, any shadow of a doubt, that an era of people from the 16th century all the way up to Jim Crow misinterpreted the text, used the word of God for its own devilish devices, and made Christianity a mockery. Melissa, are there any questions? Yes. On Zoom, Sister Marlena asked, what happened to the slavery, to slaves when they read the Bible? I think that was kind of addressed in the video, but she asked that question before. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Sister Robeson asked, who gave anyone authority to be over African Americans, regardless of what we have accomplished, we are still called the N-word today. Yes, um, and, and, and it's really, I can answer that question complex, or I can answer that question simple. Uh, which one would you rather have? <laughs> the simplistic answer to that question is how God says it in Hebrews, every authority he has ordained, right? In other words, he's allowed leadership to be where it is. Sometimes God allows leaders to be in place who are not ones who will do his bidding, and there are those who he put in place that will do what he has called them to do. Sometimes God anoints one for his purpose, and sometimes God allows one to rise because of his children being out of place. Uh, when we are out of place, God can uh, allow a ruthless leader to come into power. Um, but this is not to jump to suppose that slavery is because we were not uh, connected to him in such a way. I do believe Romans 8.28 does show up in the context of our history. But I do want you to understand, I heard somebody say, well, if it wasn't for slavery, um, I never would have known about Jesus. No, baby, I'm sorry. Um, uh, If it wasn't for us coming over, I never would have known about Christ. No, that's not true. Uh, Because there were many black people people there was a there was an African Christianity before there was a European Christ let me say that again there was an African Christianity before there was a European Christ all right and uh, the 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 urban apologists and, and all of those have a great book out concerning that Christianity was black. Oh, excuse me. Christianity was black before it came to America. There were African Christians before the transatlantic slave trade. You had some of those particular what we call them church fathers, Tertullian, Origen, uh, 
Augustine, Africans, African, African men. There was a Christianity of the East before we got this westernized, whitewashed Christianity. And so that is just a little anecdotal Bible study, conversation with us, with you all, on right after July the, four, July the 4th, and understanding that July 5th is the day that Frederick Dulles says, no, that's not my holiday. That's yours. Yes. There's a question behind me. Mm hmm Yeah. What's your premise? What's, what's the premise you're making? Oh, okay. The Ethiopian. The Ethiopian. Yes, 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 yes. Because, uh, I mean, uh, until uh, the white folks came and started going to Africa um, and living in Africa, which is how apartheid began, um, Gandhi came into opposition because white folk came in the, from England and everywhere else to, to destroy India. Um, uh, now listen, let me just say this. This is my disclaimer for all my white friends. Uh, all of y'all ain't bad. Uh, n neither, uh, neither do all black people steal. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, uh, but but, but, but we, we've got to tell the truth. And the Bible says, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Amen. And uh, I think it's important that our nieces and nephews, uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren understand that we don't serve, a, a Christianity is not a white man's religion. Uh, that we are found in the Bible, and uh, we can connect the dots. The Bible doesn't talk about race. It talks about nationality. It talks about, you know, the Amalekites, nationality, and the Canaanites, and then the land of Canaan, the Moabites, the land of Moab. Uh, Ruth was not a Jew, but she was a sexy brown frame sugar uh, that, that, that caught the eye of a man named Boaz. Y'all, not beat your ass, but bo <laughs> Boaz. So some of y'all got shocked. Oh, my God. Y'all need to go see my friend Jensen. Hey, man, Pastor Jensen, he says, he says you got to find Boaz. Not broke ass. <laughs> not his cousin. <laughs> y'all don't, <laughs> don't shout me down. Don't send me no letters. No, don't send me no letters. Jensen Franklin said it first, and he's a white man. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Evangelist Waters, like the Lord Jesus, help him. Help him. Amen. Yes, Melissa. Pastor, you have another one. Galaxy A10 says, so the Bible was used to control and hold Africans to believe that the lie, that slavery was God's way for us and not liberty. Exactly. That's why they refuse to allow slaves to read. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can do a whole workshop and class on this, um, uh, but there's so many more topics we have to look at. I just want y'all, I just want to wet your whistle. Uh, I want to spark, amen, a, an investigative aspect in you to really go deep into the word of God. Um, there, was pam there were pamphlets that were made, ooh, excuse me, made for slaves to read. Um, um, uh, when you had black preachers like Turner uh, who knew the truth but was refused to preach the truth. Uh, they forbade him, excuse, excuse me, they forbade him to preach the truth. And this is why he stood up because he couldn't preach the liberty to the slave. And that's why you had that rebellion. Matt Turner, my dude. So yeah, so, 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 so that's just, that's our anecdotal aspect tonight. Um, I just wanted to 
give y'all something to chew on. Um, uh, we all, we'll have, um, uh, there's a whole pamphlet that I have, some intellectual property that I have that I will um, give to New Providence members uh, free of charge. Uh, everybody else in the state of Florida uh, in this class in my Congress Christian education, they got to pay for it. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, membership has its privileges. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so we're we're getting ready to do that. Remember, uh, well, before I go in, any any other questions, any comments? Uh, did you all learn anything tonight? Did you get anything out of this tonight? Amen. Come on, let's thank God for uh, the, the lesson tonight. Here's, here, here's the answer to the question. Is Christianity a white man's religion? No. Did the white man, during that time, uh, those 246 years, use the word of God uh, in a sadistic and evil way to validate what they were doing? Utilizing slavery as an economic engine. Um, the biblical understanding of slavery is not what we went through. It was a form of endangered servitude. Uh, the, the, the Bible even goes to, to point out that, uh, you know how somebody has a sign that says, I'll work for food? Well, here's how you can work for food according to the Bible, all right? You can come and you cut my grass every week. I pay you a certain amount of money every week cutting my grass and you do that for seven years. Seven years, you, you, you're working for food, you, or you come live in my house, and you do da-da-da-da-da, this is our agreement, for seven years. And then there's a part in the text says that if you want to stay there and not leave, sister love, you get your ear pierced. <laughs> you get your ear pierced, brothers. Yeah. We, we have our ears pierced, left ear, right ear. You get your ear pierced to show that you're connected to that family and you are an endangered servant. A and, uh, and notice now, you were not kidnapped. You were not forced into it. You signed up for it. Big difference. Bible even says that if the master and the slave get into a dispute, and the slave dies, the master shall also die for killing the slave. It's in the Bible. They showed you the one that if a slave and a master get into it and the master beat the slave and the slave did not die but wait two days and if he recovers and y'all restore that relationship. So Willie Lynch says, beat him to one inch before death. Beat him in such a way that he's one inch away from death to scare all the other male slaves. That's what Willie Lynch said. When the, in the colonial, he was in the Bahamas and the and the, and and uh, the Virgin Islands uh, handling the slaves. They said, we got some unruly Negroes up here. We need you to come get these jokers together. Willie Lynch said, tie his legs and his arms and put him to some horses and have the horses pull his limbs off. Make an example out of one of them. And then what mama started doing to save baby boy, mama start pushing baby girl in front of master. Calm him down. Soothe his anger. What Mrs. Master can't do, you do. And that's why all of us light-skinned folk came. <laughs> I ain't want to message you, sister love. <laughs> Before I start playing golf, I would probably have been in the house too. <laughs> that's how you, that's how it happened. Yes, sis, sis, uh, night. Comment. When I was a child, my mom.
Momo over here saying I was huge. So uh, I was about eight, nine years old. So my dad, he always read the Bible. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't see what I can do with the Bible telling me to buy a pound of wheat. So I asked him one day, I said, Dad, what color is Jesus? So he said, well, my Bible told me that his skin is like copper and his hair is like sheep hair. So you figure it out. What kind of hair she got? <laughs> so I said, now nah, please say so. Now you got the answer. You got the answer. That's <laughs> right. The answer. And also he, my mom and my dad, they live in Philadelphia before they had children. And dad said because of the, the segregation of the water fountain and everything else up there, he couldn't stay, so he moved back home. Right, right. That's that's that. Uh, there's a, a movie out. I think it's called Sweetwater. I think that's what it's called. A uh, young black man, young black boy, uh, in the South had to always drink from colored only, and in his mind, that that white water had to taste better. It had to taste better because it's white only. Same water. Same conduit, same plumbing, same pipe, just a dis different faucet. Pastor? Yes. Pastor, we have one more um, on Facebook. We have Sister Carita, Carita Jackson Rozier. She asked, was there 75 books of the Bible removed? We're going to get into the what's called Sister uh, Carita Jackson, is that what it is? Yes. We'll, we'll get into the apocryphal books. Um, I don't like using the, 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 the phraseology or the term removed. I like using not included. Um, um, uh, now, they're, they're excellent reading there's some good reading right um it's it's some like the maccabees and the book of of uh, uh noah um and there are some other books in the apocryphal um it doesn't necessarily equate to um, the bible having falsities um but i will say this that the King James Version is not the most accurate translation that we have uh, when we when it comes to the to the to the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Arab Aramaic. Uh, so, um, but we're going to touch that. That's one of those kind of conversations we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, the canonization of the Bible, uh, how it was canonized, why it was it canonized, the way it was canonized. And um, uh, and what is the apocrypha? We'll talk about that. Apocrypha um, means false in a sense, means a false pseudo rather than false false script. Um, so, any other any other questions? No, no, sir. Okay, all right, all right. I enjoyed this tonight. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Um, uh, Sean told me don't say nothing, but Sean, I'm itching to say something, but amen, amen. Um, I'm going to be obedient to my trustee chairman, amen. But uh, sometimes um, people say stuff that they don't know of, know about. Um, but we're going to get into a lot of topics, a lot of topics. So I hope you all are going to be ready. Um, be, pair, be prepared to be, you know, uh, have some shock value, like I shocked y'all with Boaz and not, you know, don't marry dumbass. And <laughs> right. So, Mama, don't look at me <laughs> like that. It's, it's a twist on Boaz. It's B O A Z. And, uh, and so, uh, shock value. There's some stuff that comes like that. I'm, um, uh, we're going to talk about is the Bible misogynistic. Y'all know what I mean by that? Is the Bible male dominated? 
Is it a, or is it a document that only supports the male perspective? Um, is God a man or a woman? Is God male or female? Is God both? Is God neither? We're, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about um, really touch, touchy subjects um, that um, you all hope, hopefully, uh, will be ready to learn about. What disqualifies you for ministry? What disqualifies you? Yes. I will be teaching uh, the Florida General Baptist Convention Congress of Christian Education. Class I'll be teaching is whose religion is it? Um, going to look at Christianity in depth and, um, and have some comparative analysis with other religions. So I'll be teaching that at the state congress. Uh, our SeaWorld Congress of Christian Education starts next Monday. And uh, I want everybody on deck on Thursday to be in the house. We're going to have a church service. Amen. I'm going to give my address as Congress President. And then we're going to go ahead on. Amen. Oh, we're going to take up an offering for the President. Amen. And then we're going we're gonna to go home. Amen. Uh, we have labored this year uh, in spite of everything. We have labored and tried to put a, a lot of things before you for your Christian education and growth. Yes, Melissa. Deaconess McCray uh, wants to let you know. She says, thank you. Thanks again for the message. We learned a lot. It was a good lesson tonight. I thank uh, Pastor Carwell and thank God for the word tonight. Enjoy the lesson. Amen. Praise God. Come on, let's thank God for Sister McCray, Deacon McCray. And to everybody who's listening to us on tonight, uh, to thank you for your presence. Um, I mean, we can get into uh, the, the whole misnomers, the pre-Adamic aspect of it, the Adamic aspect of it, the Noahic aspect of the black presence. Um, we can get into when Paul is confused for an Egyptian, so we know Paul could not be a European if he was confused as an Egyptian in the book of Acts. Uh, we can get into Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, this great mathematician and physicist and architect, architectural genius. Um, uh, the black power was all in the Bible. And so uh, the Cushite woman uh, uh, it found in the book of Kings, uh, we can talk about the Canaanite woman who went to Jesus because her daughter needs to be healed. And she says, Lord, even the, the dogs eat the crumb that fall from the master's table. Uh, some European theologians want to say she was not black. Sorry. Can Canaanite woman is what it is. She was a black woman that came to Jesus and said, I need you to do something for my baby. Amen. And so uh, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, one who has dedicated their life to God, reading the scriptures, going up to Jerusalem to worship, gives us an impression that he was a black Jew, uh, right? So uh, we're there, we're there, we're there. And I want you all to be proud to be there. Uh, I want you all to walk in that pride, not be prideful, but be full of pride. There's a difference, Amen. I'm, 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 I'm proud that, that I'm, I've come from a lineage of people who, who have a spirituality that supersedes any type of uh, uh, racial uh, separation. And, and we serve a, a God that even though we've been tried to be exterminated, we can't go nowhere. Amen, somebody. All right, so I'm going to let y'all go. I'm ready to go home, too. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pray for me. I'm traveling to Atlanta on uh, uh, possibly. I'm going to drive up. Uh, I just need a little time with Jesus. And uh, I'm tired of flying on planes. 
Amen. You got people that don't care. They don't care. Amen. I do. Uh, so I'm going to drive up, uh, take my time. I'm going to leave uh, probably a Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, my aunt's funeral is on Friday, and I'm going to come back home Saturday morning, and uh, we'll be ready for the word of God on Sunday. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Praise the Lord. Um, Deacon McGregor, Deacon McGregor, we're going to do that. And, uh, and for those of you who are watching us, um, sorry I've been paying attention to them in here, not y'all out there too much. I haven't looked into the camera. Sorry. Amen. Uh, I'm getting used to this kind of stuff. Um, but we want you all to help us out as well. Uh, as we, Sister McKinney, wanted to know we'll be um, taking up a collection tonight to be a blessing to the ministry and what God has called us to do. Uh, we want you to give on Cash App, give a five, amen, or on Zelle tonight. Uh, we thank God for you on tonight. And, uh, and listen, put your questions in. Um, and let me just say this. Let me just say this to, to those of you out there. Um, I'm not the guy that will like to debate with you to prove you are wrong. That's just not what my cause is. My cause is to give my truth as God has given it to me to disseminate to the people that he has called me to pastor and to lead. The truth of the matter is neither one of us, if you are in opposition, neither of us know empirically that we're right. In other words, scientifically, we can't prove that God exists. Neither scientifically can you prove that God doesn't exist. And so when we talk about these areas of religion and foundational principles, uh, we're not here to prove anybody wrong. We're just here to talk about what we're talking about. And so we just thank God for your presence here tonight. And to all of you who are here tonight, thank you so much again for being with us on, on tonight. Amen. Amen. We're getting ready to get out of here. Amen. As uh, we bow our heads and ask the Lord to bless us. Amen. During this time of um, closing. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you so much for being our God, for being our Lord, for being our Savior, for being our peace, for being our Redeemer. We thank you, Lord God, that we've learned tonight that Christianity is not the white man's religion. Not the white man's religion. But it is a religion for all of us. It's a religion for all of us. For all of us to come to the saving grace, the knowledge of the saving grace of our God, of our Lord, of our Savior Jesus Christ. God, we've learned, Father God, that the type of slavery that our ancestors went through was not what you prescribed for our people. But it was brought upon us, oh God, by a diabolical, uh, diabolical rather, scheme and ideology to increase the pockets of landowners on the backs of those who were deemed inferior. And God, we've learned, Father God, that that system was not designed the way you saw it. given us the truth tonight and we thank you for it. We leave out of here better. We're more informed. We're better equipped. We've gone deeper tonight so that we might go higher. Now bless us as we leave this place, but never your presence. Be with us. Comfort, keep, and guide us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for these who were baptized tonight. And we put arms around them in the Holy Spirit letting them know that God is going to use you in an incredible way. God bless someone listening tonight uh, who is confused, perplexed, don't know what to do next. Let them know, Father God, that you're working it out for their good, but most importantly, for your glory. Thank you tonight, God. We love you tonight. Uh, 
we thank you for the help tonight. We thank you for the team tonight. We thank you for blessing us tonight. And we give you praise. So now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, henceforth now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.